Welcome, however, <laughs> to the 45th annual Lakes and Rivers Convention. How many of you are here um, for the first time this year today that have just come in today? So there's a few of you. Welcome. We've had two very energetic and uh, exciting days of conversation and learning, I think. Who are here for the uh, to the convention for the first time this year? Great. Welcome. Who have been here for all 45 conventions? Anyone? Going once, going twice. Oh, we got one. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, there we go. I want to say hello to the virtual participants who, uh, as Eric mentioned, we had a little trouble get, getting you into the room and getting started, but we are very happy to be offering two sessions streamed this year. Um, and I hope that's been going well. If you are joining virtually for the first time today, you can ask questions. Even if you're not, you can ask questions in the chat session. We've got people monitoring um, that that can help you out. Um, and I'm not going to, um, we also, well, uh, this whole convention is put together by the Wisconsin uh, Lakes and Rivers Partnership, which is, the partnership is really all of you, but we have some key organizations that help organize everything. My organization, Wisconsin Lakes, um, which is the nonprofit uh, conservation group and association of lake organizations, the Extension Lakes Program at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, um, the Wisconsin DNR, and the um, Water Action Volunteers, which is a program of DNR and UW Extension. We all sort of are the um, key uh, organization leaders of the partnership, but our the Lakes Partner Lakes and Rivers Partnership is made up of county conservationists, other agency staff and citizens all over the state working to keep our waters uh, clean and safe and protected for now and for future generations. This event would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. I'm not gonna take the time to read them all, but they're listed up on the screen. Um, and we thank them so much for their support of this. Um, many have been supporters for many years. And um, again, we wouldn't be able to do it without them. Um, and now I would like to bring another Extension Lakes uh, stalwart, um, Sarah Winjo, to this stage. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, can we have that slide up with the list of there we go? I just wanted to give a shout out to everyone who was involved in the planning of this event. Uh, can you stand if you're part of the planning team or were involved in any way volunteering, helping out with this convention? Stand up. I want to make sure you are recognized. Thank you for all of your hard work, all of your time. Planning for next year's convention has already started. We're always looking for help and volunteers. So if you're interested, if something like this is uh, interesting to you, let me know and we'll we'll get you on the planning team. So thank you again for all of your all of your help. All right. Um, I think we're ready now. This is very exciting. So um, we're ready to get on with our plenary and I wanna introduce our featured speaker who I am so thrilled to have here and I'm so excited to introduce. Um, I met Dr. John Francis in 2005 when I first started at UW Stevens Point, and he spoke. He spoke there. His story and message was so inspiring and impactful for me that last year, when we were thinking about speakers to bring here, he was top of the list, and I couldn't wait to see if he was available, and he was. So um, we're very excited to have him here this year. Before he comes to stage, before I introduce him, we are going to show uh, a video that will tell you more about Dr. John Francis. It's graduation time again, and you can be sure that there will be many speeches urging young people to go out there and change the world. And those same young people will be wondering how. Well, tonight we have the story of one man who set about changing the world by first changing himself. Our story begins on a misty night in 1971 when two oil tankers collide beneath the Golden Gate Bridge, spilling more than a half million gallons of crude into the bay. 
At that time, John Francis was just another hippie living in West Marin County. But when he saw the oozing sludge and dying birds, he wanted to protest in a way that others thought was crazy. Francis wanted to stop riding in cars. And I found myself on the road walking and I said, well, I'm already walking here. Uh, I'm just going to keep walking. With his banjo as his companion, John Francis challenged anyone who would listen to believe in his mission. I found myself arguing with, with my friends if one person could make a difference by not riding in an automobile. So he had another idea. To stop the arguments, he would simply stop talking. I decided that I would stop speaking just for one day to give my community a gift of my silence because John was a big <laughs> talker. <laughs> this is Francis back then. He was 27 years old on the day he stopped talking in order to truly listen. That day's silence lasted 17 years. When I first stopped speaking, I could hear all the conversations pretty much that I ever had. <laughs> After about a month of not speaking, they soon went away. Without the conversations, John had only to listen to himself, and what he heard disturbed him. He realized that he had been living a lie about who he was as a black man in a white world. What I saw in the media was that I could be a buffoon or um, I could be a criminal, but could I be the person I am right now? And I didn't see that person. It took me to just stop talking until I said, oh, my God, there you are. <laughs> and, and then I just rediscovered who, who I was. And I didn't need to lie anymore. Well, I couldn't lie <laughs> because I didn't talk. I mean, I just couldn't do it. Francis went from being this know-it-all to someone who wanted to know more. So he began a pilgrimage that left his footprints across the country. John Francis. Linda Lindell. John taking a ride. He walked all the way. Huh? I saw America. I heard America speak to me. And I was very taken by what my experience was. What Francis didn't know at that time was that he was ahead of his time on the forefront of what would become a movement, environmentalism. When he found that Southern Oregon University offered a new course in environmental studies, he walked to Ashland and enrolled. He then walked to Missoula, Montana to get a master's degree, eventually ending up at the University of Wisconsin to get his PhD. Along the way, he also taught a discussion class, remember, all without speaking. Sometimes I would make these signs like so. And my class would sit around, they go, what's he saying? What's he saying? Oh, I think he's talking about clear cutting. No, 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 that's not clear cutting. He was using a handsaw and he wouldn't clear cut with a You can clear cut with a handsaw. I think he's talking about selective forestry. And I would just kind of back out because this is a discussion class and, and let the discussion go on. And Francis's education was evolving as well. I thought environment was about uh, human-made ugliness and pollution and endangered species. I started to realize that environment was really much more than that that it involved you know, human rights and civil rights and, and economic equity and, and how we treat each other when we meet each other. All along his journey from West Coast to East, the man who walked and didn't talk was being heard. In the 22 years he spent trekking across America, the once counterculture concept of environmentalism had become mainstream. By the time he arrived in Washington, D.C., the U.S. Coast Guard invited him to write pollution regulations for the nation's waterways, and the United Nations appointed him environmental ambassador. I couldn't have dreamed that up. I couldn't have seen it. 
when people said, you know, one person can't make a difference. I have to say there were doubts sometimes, you know, as I'm walking and and I am alone and I am just a black man with a banjo <laughs> walking across America. I think we just make that commitment to make the journey. And once we commit ourselves to doing it, uh, we change. We change ourselves from just sitting on the fence thinking about it to actually jumping in the field and making a mad dash <laughs> or a slow walk. And I think that's our journey. That's all of our journeys. I think each one of us has that journey, that potential in, in, in ourselves to do that. John Francis just published a book called Planet Walker and is getting ready for another walk across the United States. I hope you're excited. I hope you're ready to be inspired as much as I was in 2005. Are you ready? Please help me in welcoming Dr. John Francis. Well, um, thank you for being here. And uh, I, 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 I like to uh, say thank you for being here because after, after 17 years of not speaking, uh, those were the first words I, I spoke in Washington, D.C. in 1990, which is the 20th anniversary of Earth Day. And that's gonna be 
tomorrow. It'll be uh, the anniversary of Earth Day and the anniversary of me starting to speak again. And I spoke to a, uh, a crowd of people who had come to hear me speak. My mother and father were in the audience and my relatives, National Geographic and oh, the oh, sordid media, the Los Angeles Times, uh, they were all there. And, uh, and I said those first words, thank you for being here. And I remember saying them, I had to think about it because uh, I hadn't spoken in such a long time. Uh, it's, it's like riding a bicycle though, you get back on and you, thank you for being here. I said, thank you for being here. And my mom jumped out of her chair and she said, hallelujah, Johnny's talking. I mean, <laughs> you can imagine not having said anything. And my mother was so happy that I started speaking again. My dad, he was kind of a different fellow and he just said, uh, well, that's one. Now, <laughs> my dad said that's one because all across the country, he would come and visit me at various times. And he would come usually at that time when I was graduating from an institution from college. And he would say to me, he said, you know, John, we're really happy and we're really, proud of you graduating because you were a college dropout before and now you're graduating from college you're getting your bachelor's degree that's wonderful but what are you going to do with a bachelor's degree in general science and general studies and it, you're going to have to ride in cars and talk i'd hunch my shoulders and put on my backpack grab my banjo and i'd head out to the next place where i was going Finally, I was at the University of Montana, and my dad said to me as I graduated with my master's degree, son, we're very proud of you. Don't think we're not. But listen, what are you going to do with a master's degree <laughs> if you don't ride in cars and talk? And I shook my head. I grabbed my backpack. I put my banjo up and I started plinking my way across the rest of the country. I got as far as uh, Watertown, South Dakota. Watertown, South Dakota. And I stayed there for a winter and I was going to be a printer. Printing, printing, printing. And my dad came out because the Native Americans at the, the Sioux, at the Cheyenne River Indian Reservation, they wanted to give me a powwow and they did the other Indian reservation. They also wanted to give me a powwow. One of my friends was a Amos Spider and Amos Spider said, you know, my family wants to, to give you a, a honor blanket and we want this powwow to be in Watertown, South Dakota. Now this was gonna be the first powwow being held in Watertown, South Dakota, I have to tell you. And I wrote my mom and dad and said, you know, how wild, Rotor, Watertown, South Dakota, my dad had to show up. And he showed up and uh, there was dancing in the school of Philandro, the Indian school there sent dancers. And we were dancing in the auditorium and there was a holy man came down from Minnesota, Gary, Gary Holy Bull, he came down and he blessed the Bless the audience, bless everybody in the powwow. And he gave me a medicine bag because he wanted to make my journey to be a, a sacred journey, which I had already thought it was. And um, my dad looked at me and he says, son, how do you do this? You know, you're a black man. My dad telling me that. Like, <laughs> Get out of here, dad. <laughs> And uh, he said, and you know, here we are in South Dakota and you have all the Indians and white people dancing together. How do you do that? Punch my shoulders, I didn't know. But what I did was I showed him a letter. I got this letter from the University of Wisconsin in Madison from the Nelson Institute. It was just the Institute for Environmental Studies then. I showed it to him and he says, huh. It looks like they want to give you money. <laughs> uh, my dad was, I said, that different kind of guy. He would look at that letter and he could tell if it was real and if they really wanted to give me money because that's what I thought. 
but I gave it to him because if he said that, then I knew it must be real. <laughs> and it was an invitation to come to Madison and go to graduate school there. Now, I have to tell you, every time I went to school, to graduate school, I would say, look, oh, that's just too hard. I went to the undergraduate school, I finished, I said, that's too hard, not talking and going to school. I had to listen a lot. Going to get my master's degree in Montana, in Missoula, Montana, University of Montana, I, I, that was too hard. Teaching without talking, come on. <laughs> you know, some of the students would say things, I have to say, <laughs> I learned a lot. Some of the students would say things like that I didn't mean. And I, I would listen to them and I realized that I, I didn't mean that, but I should have. <laughs> so I learned that if you were a teacher and you weren't learning, you probably weren't teaching very well because I learned a lot from my students. It's a, this kind of way where it goes back and forth and we're learning and teaching each other all the time. We're learning, watching each other and look and see how we do things. So there I was showing my dad the letter and I said, mm, mm hmm I'm walking to Wisconsin. So I put my backpack on. My dad didn't say much and he's like, how did you get that letter? How, they're gonna give you money. And I got my banjo. And right away, I went all the way to Madison, Wisconsin. And there's one thing that, I mean, nature, I'm walking through a lot of nature in Wisconsin and, I, and we're making a documentary and I had to tell the story to the documentarians about Planet Walk and about when I got to Wisconsin, they asked me, has nature ever really made an impact on you? And I had to say, Boy, there was one time, I mean, it's always nature's making an impact on me, but there was one time in particular as I was approaching Madison. I was in a little town of Viroqua. I'm walking in the night. I don't usually walk at night, not in the West because of the oh, rattlesnakes. I think I'll stop here because the rattlesnakes would come out on the road to warm up. And if you couldn't see them, well, you might step on one. And I didn't want to do that. But at Viroco, I decided I could walk at night. And I did. I walked at night and I got look walking. The first time I'd been in Wisconsin, I crossed over at La Crosse, right? And I come on down. Next thing I know, I see all these lights. All these lights. There's thousands of lights. And I go, that must be the city of Madison. That must be Madison. There are all these lights. And I got closer and closer. I said, I didn't expect to see the city this soon. And then I realized that's not the city. That's not the city. It's, it's, the, it's the Milky Way. Because there were all over. I could look up in the sky and there were millions and thousands of lights. They were twinkling and twinkling in the sky. Wait a minute. This, this is the first time I've seen the lights blinking like that. They were blinking. And then it hit me that I was under the trees and those were fireflies. And they were blink. I'd never seen so many fireflies in my life. And it made me laugh. It made me laugh and it touched me so deep inside. And I never forgot walking through Viroqua on my way to Madison. So finally I get to Madison and I have to meet with the Dean because they're giving me a fellowship. You know, they're gonna pay for my education. They're giving me a, an advanced opportunity fellowship. And that kind of fellowship is, they were very rare, but they were for people on the margin. They were for African-Americans, Native Americans, and I got one. But they weren't ready to give it to me until I talked to the dean or met with the dean. <laughs> because they weren't very interested in giving a fellowship to some guy who doesn't talk, who walked here. So I went up to the dean's office. Akbar Ali was the dean's name. And there was this 
staff outside and they were all typing on typewriters, not computers, typewriters. And so I you know, said, oh, John Francis, yes, the dean will be here. And the dean walked by me, looked at me, and then walked into his office. Wait, the dean will see you now. So I walked in, walked in to see the dean. Dean sits down and he very naturally dressed and he goes, so, um, how did you get here? And I go, you walked here, but where did you sleep though? Beside the road? And, and how? You have a sleeping bag in a tent? And, and, and you eat on the way? Where do you get food? You cook your food and, and eat it. Just a minute. And he walks out to the outer office, which is completely all the typing had stopped. <laughs> all the secretaries. I I can understand them. I actually can understand them. <laughs> and he comes back in and he says, so wh where are you living? And I go, oh, you're going to get a fellowship. You're going to get enough money to live. You have to find a place to live. And from then, from that on, time on, I found a place to live in, in Wisconsin, in Madison, and I went to graduate school. And for two years, I studied and did all my coursework. And my dad came out again. <laughs> my dad comes out and he sees me and I have, by this time, I have a bunch of keys now because of different labs and things like that that I have access to. My dad says, looks at me and he says, huh, well, my sister said, I should leave you alone because you seem to be doing so much better when you're not saying anything. <laughs> but that's, he didn't stop there. You know, <laughs> you know, my dad, what, what are you going to do with a PhD if you don't ride in cars and talk? There are a dime a dozen. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that, but, <laughs> but we're really proud of you, son. We're really proud of you. And um, I got my backpack again, we got my banjo, and I walked to the, all the way to the uh, East Coast. And on Earth Day, the 20th anniversary of Earth Day, I, uh, 1990, I started speaking. And I want to stop there and just go back for a little bit to the time in, in, uh, Madison, when I chose my dissertation topic, which is a big thing when you're doing your PhD. And I wanted to write about oil spills. And it so happened that my major professor, John Steinhardt, had written about uh, a book called Blowout, which is about the big oil spill in 1969 in the coast, off the coast of Santa Barbara. And that's the spill which actually sparked the environmental movement here in the United States. So we had our first Earth Day in 1970, the following year. And 1971 is when I saw my oil spill. I take that my oil spill. No, that's another big oil spill that changed my life. And um, I didn't think that I was going to, you know, I wasn't really an environmentalist. I was a hippie. And hippies do hippie kind of things. And that was, you know, being an environmentalist and being an activist wasn't one of them, but it just moved me so much, that spill, that I, it made me want to uh, give up riding in motorized vehicles and just walk everywhere. And of course, everyone that when I walked all these different places around my village, which is about 350 people, small village in Northern California, called Inverness in the Point Reyes Peninsula. 
which is now a national seashore, um, people just argued with me. I, I argued too, so we argued. And that's when the arguing uh, just got too much for me and I decided that I was gonna not speak for uh, so many days, one day. <laughs> that's all I thought, one day. If I knew 17 years was behind there, I probably would not have done that. But, but uh, that one day I learned that I had not been listening. I had not been listening to uh, anyone. I would listen just enough to think I knew what someone was going to say. <laughs> How can you do that? <laughs> I know what you're gonna say and I don't believe it. And so I would stop listening to them and start thinking about how I was gonna say back to them that they were wrong, I knew the right answer and here it is. Or even if it was something I thought I believed, I could say it better. And so I stopped listening to them and me thinking, how am I gonna say that to say it better? And on that day that I didn't speak, I realized it was a was kind of a happy day and a sad day. The sad part of the day was that I, because I wouldn't listen to anything new, I couldn't let anything new or different into my, my knowledge base, I had stopped learning. I had just completely stopped learning. I thought I knew everything. And the happy part of that day was that I realized I could do this another day <laughs> and I could learn more. And eventually a week went by and uh, then a month and people were kind of asking, you know, oh my goodness, uh, when are you gonna stop? And when are you gonna start talking? And I was asking myself, when I was going to stop, when I was going to start talking, and I didn't have an answer until I came up with the idea that I was going to do this for a year. And every year on my birthday, I would ask myself, is this still appropriate? Am I still learning? And then I would make a decision whether I would go on or not. Well, I had to write my parents because I had been calling them earlier about, you know, I'm walking and not talking. And my mother asked me, says, well, why are you walking? And I said, I'm walking for the environment, mom. You know, and, and my dad would say, well, why didn't he do this when he was 16? I, said, I didn't know about the environment then, you know. So, but now I had to write them this letter to say I had stopped talking. And um, I got a letter back from my mother saying, your dad will be on the next plane. Because they thought, you know, I was in California and they thought I had been taken over by a strange California religious cult. The environment, what's that? <laughs> and that was back in, you know, 1973. <laughs> what was the environment? No one knew. And uh, so my dad came out and, you know, he wanted to see if I could talk and I didn't. And, um, we communicated, like my dad said, write it down, write it down. I had to write notes for my dad because I couldn't do mine for him. Called my mother and said, yes, he's here. No, he doesn't smoke. He doesn't drink. He seems like he's, you know, he's okay. He's healthy. Uh, people seem to like him. I don't know. No, we, I, I don't think I can bring him home. I don't think this would work back in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. well, so, uh, that's, that was that visit. Um, and so here I am now at the University of uh, Wisconsin and people are asking me, you know, what are you writing on? And I'm writing on oil spills, <laughs> go figure. I'm writing on, but, what, but my colleagues are saying, John, why are you writing on oil spills? You, you know that there's no job available for you. No one's interested in oil spills and no one was, I mean, very few people. Uh, that was changed in 1989 in March. I think it was March 29th, 1989 or March 26th. I confuse those days because the nine and the six, they turn up upside down. And at my age, I get them confused. But uh, in March of 1989, oh, Exxon Valdez ran over the Bly Reef and there was a big oil spill and everybody was interested in oil spills in the United States at that level, at that point. Can you remember that day? Can you remember the, um, the well, 
I guess, the interest that we had in how to prevent oil spills like this. It was uh, just an amazing event. And in the United States, there was only one person studying oil spills at a PhD level. Incredibly. <laughs> one person. The US Coast Guard called the school. <laughs> yes, uh, Mr. Admiral Hen. I would like to speak to uh, John Francis. He's uh, studying oil spills and we're using his data that then we want to, uh, pardon me? He, he doesn't speak. Vow of silence. Oh, oh, um, well, we actually wanted him to come out to Washington and help us uh, put together these re new regular, pardon me? He only walks. Is there somebody at your university that's normal? <laughs> no, no, we're all up in the ivory tower. We're all crazy. Uh, and so the, he did speak with my major professor, which gave him the answers that they needed in order to go forward with their work. Um, but after that, uh, you know, I finished my examinations and I started walking to the East Coast and I got to uh, Washington and uh, well, I got to the Cape May first and I put my foot in the water and it was actually seven years and one day from the time I put my foot in the water in California and the, and the Pacific to the, to the Atlantic and uh, started talking on, on Earth Day, which uh, I wanted to talk because Things had changed for me when then I wanted to remind myself about the environment, that I was going to speak for the environment this day. And the environment had uh, changed for me from being just about pollution and loss of species and habitat and climate change. Even that had changed on my on the walk all the way across the country. And now everybody was starting to speak about environment where before no one knew what I was talking about. Seven years, and, and that happened in that time, seven years. And uh, I wanted to say that if people are part of the environment, this was really important to me. I mean, I learned all about the, the studies that we do and the science and things, and it was like, wow, that's important stuff. And it is. It's like, keep doing it keep doing that science, keep measuring, keep doing, trying to change policy, keep doing that. But I realized that if science was about people, if it was about people, the environment, then it was about human rights and civil rights and gender equality and economic and education equity and all the ways that we relate to each other, all the ways, even more than I know. And so I decided to speak on that day. And I said, thank you for being here because I realized that without you, there is no me. There's no communication. And there's a South African word now. I'm in South Africa preparing to walk from Cape Town to Khartoum. And there's a war going on in Sudan right now. And I'm hoping by the time I reach there, there's going to be peace. But the word is Ubuntu, which means I am because you are. There's another word, which in Hosa, which I went walking through one of the townships, means hello. And that was Marlo. Marlo, as a young man taught me that, he says, John, this is Marlo. Say Marlo, Marlo. And then you have to say, they will say back to you, away. And I say, oh, great, away. They, so one says Marlo to you, you say away. Let me hear you say hello to me, Marlo. Okay, away. See, uh, we're speaking African now. <laughs> and, and the thing that he told me, he says, now, if there is a, a group of people you're saying hello to, you say Moreni. And so I'm going to say, 
Moraine to you, and you say, away. Okay, Moraine. Away. Okay, thank you so much. No, I say that. No, <laughs> I say Moraine. You say away. <laughs> okay, let me try that again. Moraine. All right, okay, that's good. That's Africa there. I'm not there yet. I haven't started walk. Well, I have. I walked the first hundred miles in February. I go back in January to walk the next thousand miles. But I'm still here with you right now. And why is this important? Why is this important? Uh, is because the name of this talk that I uh, that I'm giving is called "As We Aspire, So We Shall Become." Well, after I started speaking. I got hired by the, the US Coast Guard to write oil pollution regulations for the United States. Oil pollution, right, the Coast Guard hired me. And I should tell you, I was up in Vermont when I got that call. And fortunately, because I was talking then, I could talk on the phone. <laughs> yes, yes, this is John Francis. You, you want me to come to Washington? to work at the Coast Guard to write the Oil Pollution Act of 1990? Yes, I can do that. I, I can do, pardon me? You're, you're sending a plane ticket? Oh, um, I actually, I don't fly in planes. But that's all right, Dr. Francis. You can take the train and we'll reimburse you. Uh, really, I, I don't take the train either. There's a long silence, and I can see the dollar signs of this job that I was going to get go flitting away in the shadows. <laughs> hmm. Dr. Francis, you don't ride in cars either, do you? No, no, I don't. Um, okay, let me get back to you. They're going to get back to me. Now, you know that the government is not going to hire anybody <laughs> who doesn't ride in cars. And hello? Ah, their boss says we absolutely have to have Dr. Francis here in Washington. How can he get here? Well, I can ride my bicycle. That would take about two months. They said they'll be waiting. So there it is. I'm, I got a job right out of university. I'm going to be writing the regulations for the United States, helping write them. <laughs> and uh, it takes a team to do all this stuff, as we know. And uh, let me call my dad right now <laughs> and, and let him know. I mean, notice I don't have, we don't have these buttons yet, <laughs> nor do we have the... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, ubiquitous cell phone. <laughs> Dad, yeah, guess what? You know what the Coast Guard was trying to get my number from you? Yeah, but I just got hired by them. The Coast Guard, Dad. He, he wants to know what Coast Guard. <laughs> like, what Coast Guard? The US Coast Guard. Do they know who I am? <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I think, maybe. Who, who do they think I am? I don't know, Dr. Francis. Ah, my dad says the world certainly has changed. <laughs> and, and I appreciate that. Yes, the world certainly has changed. But um, if someone had told me, and this is important stuff here now, getting to the end of this talk, um, before I play the banjo again, sorry. <laughs> if someone had told me, John, you know, you're gonna, you wanna make a difference. You know, I see the oil spill out there. And I said, uh, yeah, I wanna make a difference. And they said, well, look, John, just get out of your, get out of your car and, and start walking east, just walk east. I go, oh, okay, I'm walking east. And, I'm going to make a difference, right? Yeah, 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 you're making, keep going, keep going. 
Yeah. And shut up too. <laughs> You're going to make a difference. And, you know, I would have thought, well, you know, it's the leafy stuff that they play with out there in California. <laughs> They've been probably doing too much of that because that sounds crazy. That sounds crazy. But really, that's exactly what happened. 20, it took 20 years for me to get to the other side of the country after seeing that oil spill and be at the Coast Guard headquarters for the Coast Guard Department of Interior writing oil pollution regulations for the United States. Wow. I mean, I couldn't have seen that, you know, and I became a goodwill ambassador and went on to walk the length of South America. I couldn't have seen that. And it's that kind of commitment that I feel in this room, we all have. We've all committed ourselves to a journey. We've all committed ourselves to make this a better world. We don't really know what it's going to look like when we get there. How is this happening? How are we going to do that? How, what are the steps? We're doing the science. We're out there doing the restoration. We're doing all the things necessary for it to happen. And sometimes it seems to be elusive. But I want to give you one hint. Do everything that you're doing now and realize that we're all in this together. Make it inclusive. Do it with kindness. Do it with love. Do it with respect for everyone. Because that is also part of the environment. And how we treat each other is going to manifest in the physical environment around us. And it's also going to make our work more powerful. It's going to give energy and agency to the work that we're doing. So keep on doing what you're doing and keep on loving your neighbor and respecting yourself and respecting your neighbor. And I'm going to end right there by saying, as we aspire, so shall we become.
Thank you. Thank you again for your, sharing your time with us. And we do have actually time for questions. And I'm going to assist mostly by repeating the questions out loud, both for the benefit of Mr. Francis and also for the benefit of our uh, virtual audience. So anybody who has a question, I'd say just stand up, raise your hand, and I'll try to recognize you from up here. So we have a, a woman back here, please. So the question is one question, how did you get to Stevens Point, Wisconsin? Uh, oh, good, this is still working, huh? Well, good, that's a good question. Uh, I didn't walk here. <laughs> and and uh, there's a story that as I was in um, uh, Venezuela, I was approaching a prison town called El Dorado. A very infamous prison town. They have an island off the coast called Devil's Island, which is holding prisoners. And I think it's Papillon was one of their uh, famous prisoners. But approaching this, I met a regiment of uh, National Guard, uh, Guarda Nacional, and they were uh, tasked with helping guard the a prison because there have been lots of escape attempts lately. And I was able to speak with the commandante, and he said, John, you know, you're going to go past the, the prison gate and they're probably going to, you know, challenge you uh, because we're looking for people escaping. And, um, but, you know, just don't worry about it. You let them know who you are and, and, and it'll be okay. And so sure enough, as I'm walking past the prison, uh, prison gate, and before I got, I should say that, I should set this up by saying before, I thought, you know, maybe I am escaping. And I'm wondering if this disguise of being Dr. Francis, the UN goodwill ambassador walking around the world, would let the prison guards, will you let me go by? And, and so as I got to the prison gate, sure enough, there was a prison guard with an M16 pointed at me. And he says, pasaporte, pasaporte. And I say, listen, uh, in my street Spanish, I, I don't have to show you my passport. It's in the back of my backpack. I'm Dr. Francis, I'm the UN ambassador and I'm walking around the world. And if you don't believe me, ask Comandante Jesus. I just talked to him and I kept walking. Now, I have to tell you, this is not <laughs> the person that I am would do that, especially with somebody pointing a M16 at me. I'm like, but a hundred yards later, I'm in the forest and I'm going, free at last. Oh, I'm free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Now, somebody else said that before me. <laughs> and I had to ask myself, what, John, what are you doing? What was that all about? And I realized it took a few miles that I was in prison. And the prison that I was in was of my own making. It had become a prison. It was that I didn't ever get into motorized vehicles. And I was going to have to let myself out of that prison. Now, I say it was of my own making, just like not speaking. Not speaking was kind of a, a prison, but it never became a prison to me because every year I revisit that decision and decided that, oh, oh, I can do another year. But it was a living decision. But not riding in cars was just flat out. I just didn't ride in cars. I didn't do motorized vehicles. I just walked. I never bothered to revisit that decision. And over the years, that decision became a prison. That decision became calcified because I never revisited. I never, it was never a breathing decision. And so I had to let myself out. I never thought I was gonna have a PhD. I never thought I was gonna be a UN goodwill ambassador. I could never see those things. And I didn't see that I was leaving my parents. I never thought I would be in South America really walking away, walking away from my home in 
New Jersey and my parents who I would probably never see again. And then I realized that I had a responsibility that was even bigger than my decision to not ride in cars. And that was to the people here in the state of Wisconsin who helped me get this education, who helped me get this PhD. I had an even bigger responsibility to the United Nations who made me a goodwill ambassador to the world's grassroots communities, the world's grassroots communities, not just in South America. I had an even greater responsibility to my mother and father who raised me to be the person that I am today. And so I got on the plane. Oh, I first got into a, a VW bug and drove, I didn't drive, they drove me all the way back to uh, Caracas. And it was just uh, Christmas Eve, I flew home. I called my parents up and asked them to, if they were gonna be home because our friend Fouad, I said, is gonna come visit them. And they said, well, we can meet Fouad at the airport. I said, no, no, he'll get there. They said, why is Fouad gonna come visit us on Christmas? Isn't he Muslim? I said, well, yes, he is. But Fouad would come and visit my parents anytime, even when I wasn't there. That shows you that he was a good friend of the family. And so I knocked on the door after that flight, and my dad answered the door, and he said, son, this is the happiest Christmas of my life. That's two. <laughs> My mother was upstairs and she said, John, is Fouad downstairs? Yeah, go, go up and see your mother. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Fouad's downstairs. <laughs> so I walked upstairs to, to see my mom and I was standing there. Now, Fouad is, a, you know, kind of a, a smaller, on the smaller side and very, you know, but I'm like very, and, I don't know how my mother did this, but she says, ah, Fouad, it's so good to see you. <laughs> How's your family? Very good, very good. And she looked at me some more and she goes, Fouad, you know, you look a lot like our son, Johnny. <laughs> you are our son, Johnny. <laughs> I was thinking maybe I should just walk for another 22 years because <laughs> it was so much fun to be with my mom then so she started crying and everything. So, but I walked here now, no, <laughs> I, I, I didn't walk here. I actually drove from Madison. I flew into Madison and rented a car and drove through the hail and everything to get here. So, um, and I use motorized vehicles now. I do have a my own car, which is a hybrid, a Prius that was given to me by a movie producer. Hmm. Maybe there'll be a movie. <laughs> we do have time for a couple more questions. Gentlemen in the back here. Or I'm sorry, yes. So the question is, what advice do you have to Wisconsin people in the room to protect our waters from oil and, and ostensibly from oil spills or, or things like that. What are, what are some of those contemporary issues? Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of, um, in, particularly in Pennsylvania and, and where I'm from, a lot of fracking issues. Um, and, you know, I, when I say continue doing what you're doing, uh, that's what I, I kind of mean because we're all on our own path to make change and to make a difference. Um, they're really important issues for me are native issues like, you know, how native people think about seven generations. But really, we're talking about sustainability. So it's like, I think they've been doing that for a long time. So if we can uh, learn from them, you know, that we should, practice some of the things that they might have to teach us. So, but the policy issues are gonna be the po same policy struggles that we have. I started doing what, what we call um, regulatory 
negotiations with uh, the oil companies, and this is a great tool when you get to that place with oil companies and then the shareholders of environmental groups and uh, the like and indus industry groups. When we talk, started talking about writing a regulation down, uh, someone usually takes it to court, let's put that in court, and then the resource that you're trying to, to preserve and uh, protect is without that protection. So at the Coast Guard, what we did is we got everybody together once we sent out all the notices and we came up with a regulation. We put the regulation on the table and we got everybody together and we negotiated, okay, oil companies, what do you need? Environmental groups, what do you need? Shareholders, what do you need? And a judge presided over that negoti negotiation. So it, the regulatory negotiations allowed everybody to sit at the same table. And I, I think it's painful, it's not easy. Uh, it doesn't have to be painful, you know. Remember if we put in the uh, love, respect and forgiveness for all the other stuff, uh, we gotta do that. Uh, but we come up with a regulation that everybody can live with. You know, it's just something we have to do. I don't have the answer. Um, like I say, when I was in class, sometimes people say, some of my students would say things that I didn't mean, but which I should have. And so when we go into a situation to know that, well, really, um, we can let go of some of the things we think, we believe, in order for us to communicate. When I didn't speak, communication was more a, an agreement um, than you know, me telling someone something and then them saying, yeah, that's right. You know, and then saying back to me, no, I don't like that. It was, I do some sign like that and they go, you mean such a, I go, oh, that's good. That's good enough, yeah. <laughs> and because it came from that other person's own mind, they were more willing to say, yeah, that was my idea. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just keep doing what you're doing. We have one question over here. Sure, and I'm gonna repeat the question again. How can we use art and music to help us communicate science reflecting on your musical talents and, and the way people operate in our world? Um, that's a great question. I mean, there's an art show here, <laughs> right, right there, <laughs> that um, is it, it attempting to do just that. And I think that, uh, my music, thank you for that. I mean, my, my music has uh, just been developing uh, over years and years. And, and uh, from I just got an email with, with a link back to 1983 where someone had recorded me, uh, videotaped me playing. And it's like, oh, God, oh, no, that, <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, but, you know, I was enjoying the music and people around me enjoyed it. And I think it was really important that I had something like a banjo to, to play. Uh, I think art is, that's the, one of the goals of being an artist is to communicate these things that are really difficult to communicate in any other way. Uh, there's something that was really, uh, I, that I wanted to say that I remembered that I think I forgot it. <laughs> That's how things happen now. I, I, when I started, I was 27. That's when I stopped talking. And now I'm 77. So it's like things are hmm, different. <laughs> things are different. But um, I hope I, that answered some of your questions. Thank and I you. and I think that we in the Lakes Partnership are going to continue using arts as well and, and try to incorporate more music into what we do as well. 
We have, <laughs> I'm getting applause from Amy in the back. She likes that idea. Um, so I, we do have to close this session and begin planning to go to the next session. Please, again, join me in, in giving appreciation to Dr. Francis. We do need to um, empty this room out because they have to reset it for lunch, which is coming up. And so between now and lunch, we have a break, actually. There's coffee and there's going to be baked goods and other goodies back in the commons area. So please make your way with some due diligence to get over there uh, so that this room can be reset by the hotel staff because they only have so much time. Thank you so much. <laughs>